Chapter 10.1 of the 9-11 Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mary Rohde. The 9-11 Commission Report. Section 10. Wartime. After the attacks had occurred, while crisis managers were still sorting out a number of unnerving false alarms, Air Force One flew to Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana. One of these alarms was of a reported threat against Air Force One itself, a threat eventually run down to a misunderstood communication in the hectic White House Situation Room that morning. While the plan at the elementary school had been to return to Washington, by the time Air Force One was airborne at 9.55 a.m., the Secret Service, the President's advisers, and Vice President Cheney were strongly advising against it. President Bush reluctantly acceded to this advice, and at about 10.10, Air Force One changed course and began heading due west. The immediate objective was to find a safe location, not too far away, where the President could land and speak to the American people. The Secret Service was also interested in refueling the aircraft and paring down the size of the traveling party. The President's military aide, an Air Force officer, quickly researched the options and sometime around 10.20 identified Barksdale Air Force Base as an appropriate interim destination. When Air Force One landed at Barksdale at about 11.45, Personnel from the local Secret Service office were still en route to the airfield. The motorcade consisted of a military police lead vehicle and a van. The proposed briefing theater had no phones or electrical outlets. Staff scrambled to prepare another room for the President's remarks, while the lead Secret Service agent reviewed the security situation with superiors in Washington. The President completed his statement which for security reasons was taped and not broadcast live, and the traveling party returned to Air Force One. The next destination was discussed. Once again the Secret Service recommended against returning to Washington, and the Vice President agreed. O'Foot Air Force Base in Nebraska was chosen because of its elaborate command and control facilities and because it could accommodate overnight lodging for fifty persons. The Secret Service wanted a place where the President could spend several days if necessary. Air Force One arrived at Ofut at 2.50 p.m. At about 3.15, President Bush met with his principal advisers through a secure video teleconference. Rice said President Bush began the meeting with the words, We're at war and that Director of Central Intelligence George Tenet said the agency was still assessing who was responsible, but the early signs all pointed to Al-Qaeda. That evening the Deputies Committee returned to the pending presidential directive they had labored over during the summer. The Secretary of Defense directed the nation's armed forces to Defense Condition 3, an increased state of military readiness. For the first time in history, all non-emergency civilian aircraft in the United States were grounded, stranding tens of thousands of passengers across the country. Contingency plans for the continuity of government and the evacuation of leaders had been implemented. The Pentagon had been struck. The White House, or the Capitol, had narrowly escaped direct attack. Extraordinary security precautions were put in place at the nation's borders and ports. In the late afternoon, the President overruled his aide's continuing reluctance to have him return to Washington, and ordered Air Force One back to Andrews Air Force Base. He was flown by helicopter back to the White House, passing over the still smoldering Pentagon, at 8.30 that evening, President Bush addressed the nation from the White House. After emphasizing that the first priority was to help the injured and protect against any further attacks, he said, We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. He quoted Psalm 23, 
though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. No American, he said, will ever forget this day. Following his speech, President Bush met again with his National Security Council, NSC, expanded to include Secretary of Transportation Norman Mineta and Joseph Albaugh, the director of the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Secretary of State Colin Powell, who had returned from Peru after hearing of the attacks, joined the discussion. They reviewed the day's events. Chapter 10.1 immediate responses at home as the urgent domestic issues accumulated white house deputy chief of staff joshua bolton chaired a temporary domestic consequences group the agenda in those first days is worth noting partly as a checklist for future crisis planners it began with problems of how to help victims and stanch the flowing losses to the american economy such as organizing federal emergency assistance. One question was what kind of public health advice to give about the air quality in lower Manhattan in the vicinity of the fallen buildings. Compensating victims. They evaluated legislative options, eventually setting up a federal compensation fund and defining the powers of a special master to run it. Determining federal assistance. On September 13th, President Bush promised to provide $20 billion for New York City, in addition to the $20 billion his budget director had already guessed might be needed for the country as a whole. Restoring Civil Aviation On the morning of September 13, the national airspace reopened for use by airports that met newly improvised security standards. Reopening the Financial Markets after extraordinary emergency efforts involving the White House, the Treasury Department, and the Securities and Exchange Commission, aided by unprecedented cooperation among the usually competitive firms of the financial industry, the markets reopened on Monday, September 17. Deciding when and how to return border and port security to more normal operations evaluating legislative proposals to bail out the airline industry and cap its liability. The very process of reviewing these issues underscored the absence of an effective government organization dedicated to assessing vulnerabilities and handling problems of protection and preparedness. Though a number of agencies had some part of the task, none had security as its primary mission. By September 14, Vice President Cheney had decided to recommend, at least as a first step, a new White House entity to coordinate all the relevant agencies rather than tackle the challenge of combining them in a new department. This new White House entity would be a Homeland Security Advisor and Homeland Security Council, paralleling the National Security Council system. Vice President Cheney reviewed the proposal with President Bush and other advisors. President Bush announced the new post and its first occupant, Pennsylvania Governor Tom Ridge, in his address to a joint session of Congress on September 20. Beginning on September 11, Immigration and Naturalization Service agents working in cooperation with the FBI began arresting individuals for immigration violations whom they encountered while following up leads in the FBI's investigation of the 9-11 attacks. Eventually, 768 aliens were arrested as special interest detainees. Some, such as Zacharias Musawi, were actually in INS custody before 9-11. Most were arrested after. Attorney General John Ashcroft told us that he saw his job in directing this effort as risk minimization, both to find out who had committed the attacks and to prevent a subsequent attack. Ashcroft ordered all special interest immigration hearings close to the public, family members, and press, directed government attorneys to seek denial of bond until such time as they were cleared of terrorist connections by the FBI and other agencies and ordered the identity of the detainees kept secret. INS attorneys charged with prosecuting the immigration violations 
had trouble getting information about the detainees and any terrorist connections. In the chaos after the attacks, it was very difficult to reach law enforcement officials who were following up on other leads. The clearance process approved by the Justice Department was time-consuming, lasting an average of about 80 days. We have assessed this effort to detain aliens of special interest. The detainees were lawfully held on immigration charges. Records indicate that 531 were deported, 162 were released on bond, 24 received some kind of immigration benefits, 12 had their proceedings terminated, and 8, one of whom was Musawi, were remanded to the custody of the U.S. Marshal Service. The Inspector General of the Justice Department found significant problems in the way the 9-11 detainees were treated. In response to a request about the counterterrorism benefits of the 9-11 detainee program, the Justice Department cited six individuals on the special interest detainee list, noting that two, including Musawi, were linked directly to a terrorist organization and that it had obtained new leads helpful to the investigation of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. A senior al-Qaeda detainee had stated that U.S. government efforts after the 9-11 attacks to monitor the American homeland, including review of Muslims' immigration files and deportation of non-permanent residents, forced al-Qaeda to operate less freely in the United States. The government's ability to collect intelligence inside the United States and the sharing of such information between the intelligence and law enforcement communities was not a priority before 9-11. Guidelines on this subject issued in August 2001 by Deputy Attorney General Larry Thompson essentially recapitulated prior guidance. However, the attacks of 9-11 changed everything. Less than one week after September 11, an early version of what was to become the Patriot Act, officially the USA Patriot Act, began to take shape. A central provision of the proposal was the removal of the wall on information sharing between the intelligence and law enforcement communities discussed in Chapter 3. Ashcroft told us he was determined to take every conceivable action within the limits of the Constitution, to identify potential terrorists and deter additional attacks. The administration developed a proposal that eventually passed both houses of Congress by large majorities and was signed into law on October 26. Flights of Saudi Nationals Leaving the United States Three questions have arisen with respect to the departure of Saudi nationals from the United States in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. 1. Did any flights of Saudi nationals take place before national airspace reopened on September 13, 2001? 2. Was there any political intervention to facilitate the departure of Saudi nationals? 3. Did the FBI screen Saudi nationals thoroughly before their departure? First, we found no evidence that any flights of Saudi nationals, domestic or international, took place before the reopening of national airspace on the morning of September 13, 2001. To the contrary, every flight we have identified occurred after national airspace reopened. Second, we found no evidence of political intervention. We found no evidence that anyone at the White House, above the level of Richard Clark, participated in a decision on the departure of Saudi nationals. The issue came up in one of the many video teleconferences of the interagency group Clark chaired, and Clark said he approved of how the FBI was dealing with the matter when it came up for interagency discussion at his level. Clark told us, I asked the FBI, Dale Watson, to handle that, to check to see if that was all right with them, to see if they wanted access to any of these people, and to get back to me, and if they had no objections, it would be fine with me. Clark added, 
I have no recollection of clearing it with anybody at the White House. Although White House Chief of Staff Andrew Card remembered someone telling him about the Saudi request shortly after 9-11, he said he had not talked to the Saudis, and did not ask anyone to do anything about it. The President and Vice President told us they were not aware of the issue at all until it surfaced much later in the media. None of the officials we interviewed recalled any intervention or direction on this matter from any political appointee. Third, we believe that the FBI conducted a satisfactory screening of Saudi nationals who left the United States on charter flights. The Saudi government was advised of and agreed to the FBI's requirements that passengers be identified and checked against various databases before the flights departed. The Federal Aviation Administration representative working in the FBI Operations Center made sure that the FBI was aware of the flights of Saudi nationals and was able to screen the passengers before they were allowed to depart. The FBI interviewed all persons of interest on these flights prior to their departure. They concluded that none of the passengers was connected to the 9-11 attacks, and have since found no evidence to change that conclusion. Our own independent review of the Saudi nationals involved confirms that no one with known links to terrorism departed on these flights. End of chapter 10.1